This is Pokemon Grueling Gold, a fan game that makes my favorite gen extremely difficult. And we all know Gen 2 needs it. The gym leaders are 10 times harder, most have 6 Pokemon on their team, and they're ready to make your life miserable. Just when you think you've got a break from the game, it puts you right back into agony. But I'm not just going to be playing through this incredibly long game. No, I decided to torture myself a little more by beating this game with only Gen 9 Pokemon, to see how they'd fare in Generation 2. This fan game is pretty neat as there are type changes to Pokemon, new moves and abilities, and and ability changes as well. This game also adds new megas. As always, I will be playing on set battle style and I won't be allowed to use potions in battle. On top of those standard rules, the game has options of its own, like randomizers and nuzlocke mode built in, and much more. I did choose normal mode as I'm sure the game is hard enough like that, but one cool thing is I chose minimal grinding, which will remove EVs on Pokemon and max out their IVs, which I think is a feature in the Kaizo games. With all that being said, we leave our home in the Paldea region and embark on our new journey in Johto. I love seeing Gen 2 and Gen 3 artwork. Lyra, for example, last time we saw her was in Gen 4 sprites, and her movement is different too. It looks like we have a built-in level cap as well as an encounter table. I went downstairs to see Mom and she asked us what starter we would like, and of course we choose the Paldean starters. So we head to the lab where these two are waiting for us. I think I'm gonna go pick Quaxley as I always pick Fue Coco, and I know there's more dark types and grass types in this game, so no point in picking Spigatito. Okay, never mind, we can find Wooper, and although Wooper is isn't a water type per se, it still reminds me of one. So, Fue Coco it is. With John Jong on the team, I continue on to meet Professor Pokemon, but on the way, we can go to the Mart in Cherry Grove to buy some Pokeballs. Then we backtrack to Route 29, where we find ourselves a Fido. I love seeing the sprite work for these Gen 9 Mons. I named her Duncan, and it's here where I realized John Jong has a different ability. His hidden ability, actually. Unaware. And we can see that Grueling Gold gives us options to see base stats since some Pokemon have new stats. We can also relearn moves, and we can change our ability and nature at will, but to be honest, I'm just gonna go with the first Pokemon we have. If I want another one with different abilities and different stats, then I'll have to catch them. I'm not gonna mess with that feature. Either way, I continued searching and found a Lechonk, who I named Petunia, and since it was now nighttime, I was able to search for Mastiff, but these Paldean Pokemon are super rare. I felt like I was running in grass forever. Regardless, when the next night cycle came, I went back home since there's grass in the cities now, and I found myself a Paldean Wooper, whom I named Blubbers. And eventually, Mastiff did show its face. This puppy has Intimidate, which is great. Welcome to the team, Spike. And there were still more Gen 9 Pokemon to catch before continuing. Such as Shocker, the Pommy, Wiggler, the Wook Trio, and Jules, the Watchroll. I'm a narcissist, I know. And this is a good example of how some moves are changed. Covet now is a fairy type move instead of normal, which is a great change to be honest. I think my favorite sprite out of all of these is Foy Coco. He's just adorable. Now I would catch more Gen 9 Pokemon, however, I'm all out of cash for Pokeballs, so these guys are going to have to wait. Once I meet Mr. Pokemon, he says he doesn't want to waste my time, which is funny, as in the regular games, that seems like the only thing he wants to do. So this is a great change because we can immediately head down to fight our rival. And he says that his starter was basically pathetic, so he dumped it in the box. And I can't stand the Quaxley slander, so Jules here can Thundershock Zubat after taking a bite. And I'm realizing this guy Zubat is level 11. You haven't even got past the second route, dude! Zubat also has a brand new ability called Vampiric, and this lets him get a little health back while using biting moves. When I tell you guys I thought this was just a little Zubat, oh my god, I mean it flinched me and killed Foy Coco, and most of my Pokemon were level 6 or lower. If you remember though, I did have Intimidate on Spike, so with that, we get two off while sacking Blubbers in the process, and then we just scary face, leer, and even lick Para until eventually Spike comes out on top. I really thought we were gonna lose there. Good job, boy. From here, I went back to Professor Elm's lab where he gives us 20 Pokeballs. Thank Arceus, and also a time changer, which is super useful for those Gen 9 Pokemon that can only be found at night. Our next objective is to fight the first gym, so off we went, but of course, before that, I caught a nimble named Lola, and for some reason, it was really hard to catch. This is a great example of power creep. Early bugs are insanely hard to catch. That's not true. I really don't know why that thing took so long to catch. All right, thanks for backing me up on that theory, Tarantula. I named her Gwen, and I thought Tarantula was part steel type, but I guess they only added that to spit up, so we have to wait a little while for that. And I don't know why, but it just feels right. Probably because its soak is insanely strong. In Dark Cave, we have three more encounters. Nevetta, the Frigibax, Himalaya, the Naklai, and Patricia, the Dunsparce. Which isn't Gen 9 right now, but he will be soon enough, if I end up using it. Now, before we can head into Violet City, we do have to fight our rival 
rival, but not silver. No, in this game, they gave us two rivals. Chris here leads Pikachu, and that went down to a couple of embers, but Meryl retaliated with an Aqua Jet. Of course, Jules had to avenge Zhang Zhang with the Thundershock, and Cyndaquil was her last Pokemon, which died pretty easily. With that, we finally arrived to Violet City, home of the first gym leader, Faulkner. But that's not the most important thing in the city. Oh no. No, see, it was this fisherman. And no, he's not going to give us a rod. Instead, he's going to give us 99 nuggets. They say to never accept candy from a stranger, but did they say anything about money? Mm, probably. But I probably shouldn't have done it regardless. And and now a millionaire. And it just goes to show that if you work hard enough, you can become one as well. There is grass in this town holding a capsa kid, and the old rod can snag us a tadbulb, who I named Pepper and Queso, respectively. That tadbulb took a very long time to find. I love how this house has a nugget on the table. Like, what is this going to do when the guy outside is literally giving them out for free? From here, we can head to Sprout Tower, where there are even more Gen 9 Pokemon. This is insane, but I'll come back for them later after I fight the Elder. The Elder leads a Hoot Hoot, and the levels here are pretty high. This is a good type matchup, but his Air Slash was doing tons of damage, and on top of that, he had a Roost. The good news was I did end up getting a Paralysis. The bad news is the following turn, I have no idea how Thundershock missed the KO, and sadly, he Roosted once more. Eventually, after trading damage for Roost, he did get paralyzed, and Jules came out on top. Bellsprout was up next, and Bellsprout has been outspeeding everything on my team, and this time is no different, so a Septic Shot left us at 1 HP, as our Pluck did loads. But of course, he had a berry juice on the plant. Knowing Jules needs to go down, I used Quick Attack. From there, it was as simple as Zhang Zhang using Ember. Following him came Mankey, and this thing had a power up punch. Thankfully, he thought I'd switch and pursued it, but I stayed in hoping for a burn. Once Zhang Zhang was out, Mankey was at plus two, and I thought I was being smart with Spike, but no. Our Intimidate just activated his Defiant ability, and now the monkey is at plus three. We're not even at the first gym yet. Now, I did Scary Face, as for some reason, he's using Pursuit instead of Power Up Punch, and that did activate defying again, but since we're outspeeding and he's being dumb, Spike ends up coming out on top. Man, screw this game. Okay, Wiggler ends up coming out on top. I'm, I'm never coming back to this place. With all that said and done, we can go ahead and take on Faulkner, and this man is no joke. He leads Watro, which obviously has Volt Absorb, so I lead him a layup. What's crazy is he does have HP Grass, but the AI didn't go for it here, which is perfect as Himalaya takes a Charge Beam, and we get a huge Smackdown off. My play was Himalaya could hopefully live HP Grass, Smackdown, and and then Pommy could dig, but we could just smack down again for the KO. And as you can see, we didn't get any experience since we're right at the level cap that the game imposes on us. Gligar is out next, and this is his ace. I know Himalaya's time is over, so I just sack, and he goes down to a new move, Dusty Dash. A priority ground type move. I was going to save Nevetta just for Gligar, as not only do we have a quad effective move, but this thing can't do much back to us. And oddly enough, Nevetta didn't KO, but we did get a speed boost, which didn't end up helping for shit. Anyways, Fletchinder was out, and it did hit a flame charge getting rid of Nevetta, but it's okay, as Spike can get in here for a big intimidate. From here, I just went back and forth, scary facing as much as possible until getting knocked out. And with this thing now being a turtle, Shocker can come in and, well, start shocking. And Shocker did with a crit on the first and a KO on the second. Ducklet was his last Pokemon, and although it did have a walking berry for Thundershock, it still died in two. Faulkner, you were a worthy first gym leader. And thanks for the Roost TM, as now I can teach that to Jules. Don't worry, I didn't forget about our Sprout Tower encounters, and although I said I'd never come back here, I, I meant after I get my Gen 9 Pokemon. Poltergeist, who I named Vintage, and Gimme Ghoul, who I named 50 Cent. And this was not a fun hunt. This thing is a 1% encounter rate, but I swear it's 0.0001 because that took way too long to find. Down south, our Gen 9 encounter was Tandem Mouse, and I named this one Dom. Please, if any of you can guess why I named it that, put it in the comments. And right after, our little Fire Croc evolved into Crocolore. There's not a thought in that little head of yours, is there? Wen also evolved while going through Union Cave, and as you can see, she is now a Steel type, which is awesome for early game. At least, I hope. I love how the game just gives me heaping amounts of useful items. At the end of the cave, this guy stops us because we need to figure out what Team Rocket is doing. Honestly, I couldn't care less. They could murder Pokemon and I still wouldn't give an F. What I do give an F about is Petrol, since for some reason he gets a huge level boost. I'm totally dead. So with that, I use the minimal grinding and level option to put me right at the cap, which is 28. And apparently Cut is a 70 base power steel type move in this game, which is neat as most games make it a grass type move. But nope, this time it's a steel type move. Also, Cut gets boosted by Gwen's new ability, Sharpness, since it's considered a slicing move. Leveling everyone up evolves some Pokemon, and now we are ready. This 
was 10 times easier being at the cap. We washed this dude away literally thanks to water bowls. With Union Cave cleared, we arrived in Azalea Town, home to the buggiest dude on the face of the earth, Bugsy. But first, oh no, inflation got to Kurt too? His whole place is being foreclosed. What has this world come to? Well, I mean, there is a dude in Violet City giving out 99 nuggets. That could have contributed to inflation. Down in Slowpoke Well, I do take care of Proton, and it's nice to know Glimit is in this game. Which reminds me, Slowpoke Well encounter. Well, there's no Glimit, but there is a Rever Room and Orthworm. And once those were caught, I went to the gym where I was stopped before I could go in. By none other than this redhead himself. I'm gonna smoke him. Okay, maybe not. This fight was easy being fully healed, but it's cool Miss Drevis has a new ability called Perish Body, which you can imagine what it does. Anyways, Bugsy, it's time. And he tells us we're about to see how powerful bugs can really be. Oh, don't worry, buddy. I know. And I also know how weak they can be. I led Himalaya to get some rock tombs off, and he goes for a sticky web. I did figure he'd U-turn, but I just stayed in as it does get a nice speed drop on Scizor. Now, he did U-turn again, which I didn't think would happen, as all he had to do was bullet punch, and figuring he'd do that again, I went into Jong Jong. But nope, out came Cinderscorch. This bug, in fact, does not have U-turn. So now I went into Wiggler on a knockoff, and that actually gives our normal speed back, which is huge. As now we can outspeed for big water pulses off. Before we went down, we also managed to get a confusion, and now we just go into Jewels. A single wing beat does it, and Scissor is back out. He's going to go for a U-turn, and I'm just gonna pluck before he gets out of here, just in case as we do eat that Aka Berry. And Ariados is holding a Citrus Berry, so we do the same thing KOing Ariados. Same thing against Scissor once more, and Masquerain is out. Not gonna lie, I should have just roosted, but either way, with that Intimidate, we Electro Ball, as that's not only special, but we have a higher special attack stat anyways. Blubber is so chill, eats that, and just rock tombs away. With Scizor being his last Pokemon, he roosts away trying to save himself, but Blubbers gets a bunch of speed drops with Mudshot, yawning away, and we swap into Jong Jong on a bullet punch, to then incinerate while he's sound asleep. Adios, Bugsy. They in fact were not powerful. From here I head into Ilex Forest, and hey, I almost forgot about you, but why are you so slow? And it's not fair that you can walk diagonally, and I can't. I did end up catching an Applin here, just in case its new Evos are in this game, and we just trucked on fighting Team Rocket with Chris, and in the process, Spike finally evolved into the good boy he is. Hopefully he doesn't get depression like Arvin's. After that, Petrol was up once more, and apparently they're trying to make Ilex Forest their base. And that's gonna drive a whole bunch of Pokemon out of the forest, so I'm not gonna let you do that. Luckily, I was with Chris this fight, because this man had a Flame Orb Heracross with Facade. Oh, and Guts. How can I forget about that? Now, it was nothing Jules couldn't handle. However, all of Chris's Pokemon were dead by that point, and Jules went down shortly after. And it snowballed from there. This man sets up toxic spites earlier in the fight, and Salazzle is super fast, so she was just Venno shocking. Every single one of my Pokemon. It was, uh, hard to watch. The second time around, I got everyone to the cap and led Spike this time, as he has Intimidate. From there, I hard switched into Gwen, since Raichu fakes out Croc, and Weezing just sets up Spikes. With Gwen on the field, I instantly go for a Sticky Web, as Raichu almost KOs Weezing, and an Earthquake goes off from Croc, but Gwen eats that up for breakfast. From there, Azumarill takes out Weezing, and Gwen's cut destroys Crocorock, and at first I was like, wow, but then I remembered it's getting boosted by our sharpness ability. Now, Salazzle and Vigoroth are in, and they both get a speed drop, which is huge. Then I Silk Trap, cause why not, and they both targeted Gwen, and Azumarill's liquidation washes Salazzle away easy. But then Big Daddy Heracross is out. Unfortunately, it did protect, which I forgot it would do, but the following turn I just Silk Trapped, and now Cut doing some damage. Since all of Chris's Pokemon are down, I Silk Trapped to get another speed drop off on the Blue Beetle, and we did outspeed, but Cut just missed the KO. And finally, Gwen has been taken out. You fought so hard, my little spider, but that death wasn't in vain as Heracross dies from his own blade. The burn burns him away, and Vigoroth is the only thing left. So a single triple dive later, and we've come out on top. Gosh, I wish Spit-Ups was a steel type in the actual games. Let me know which Gen 9 Pokemon is your favorite, I would love to know. It looks like on Route 34, we can get a Paldean Tauros, so I started hunting. All of these guys are super rare, but after some time, it looks like it's only gonna be regular Paldean Tauros. No added fire type or water type. Over in Goldenrod, Chris wants to battle us, but I went to the department store first, where we can find all of these beautiful TMs. And since I'm filthy stinking rich, I sold them out. It also looks like I Drapple might be in this game since there's a syrupy apple. And there we go. With our little caramel apple, we took on Chris in the underground. And Monsana here has the loaded dice item. So Bullet Seed destroys Pikachu and most of her team was easy until the huge power Azu came in and it obliterated two of my Pokemon. But of course, Gwen saved the day with Silk Trap and some Metal Coat boosted cuts. I love you so much, Gwen. Next up is Whitney and this could be brutal.
brutal as she still has the mill tank. I love how she says don't hold back just because her Pokemon are cute. Ma'am, that thing is ugly as shit. Since I love Gwen so much, I led her against everything. Whitney is no exception. So we trade hazards on the field, cut this ugly monkey to death, and Helioliscus up. We do tank some moves, but Hyper Voice apparently gives a boost to special attack, and Parabolic Charge does way more the next turn as well as giving her health back. Gwen has done her part in this fight, so I just sack and go into Blubbers since Toxic Spikes is on the field. Heliolisk does have HP Ice, but she didn't go for it, which is nice, although I don't know if it would have KO'd. I'm guessing not, and from there, a Bulldoze mows down that. Thruffer is out, and a Revenge kills Blubbers with a new move, Twin Bee. I did bring Vintage for this fight, and a Foul Play did nothing, but now we can start match at Gotcha Ring for health back. We do end up out damaging it, and now Audino is her next pick, which just happens to be a Mega. A Mega in the third gym is wild, but it is what it is they want us to suffer. Now obviously the plan is for Vintage to take one for the team, however we did outspeed, as well as burning it with Machigacha. It's not going to cripple it since it is a special attacker, but it will whittle it down in case. Whitney did try to soft boil, but once she realized it was no use against Wormy's Iron Head, we came out on top. And finally, it's Miltane, her pride and joy. I'd admit this one is kind of cute, but it doesn't matter as Wormy isn't a simp. She did the same thing again with Milk Drink, but I just switched in Tails on one, and all that's left is to just double kick. And with her just using Toxic, yeah, this was easy. By the way, why didn't Tails get poisoned from Toxic Spikes when he came in? I don't know, but I don't care. Give me that badge. Our next objective is to go to National Park, but on the way, Zhang Zhang evolved into Skeledurge. And once we got to our destination, we see that Team Rocket is probably trying to make another base. So we crush some grunts and make it to Proton, who leads Glamora. And all I gotta say to you, sir, is where did you get that Pokemon? Because I need it. Proton's Crobat is so difficult because it has Vampiric, plus Lefties, plus Roost. So it's just healing, and on top of that, Glamora set up spikes, but somehow Zhang Zhang did end up KOing with Torch Song since it gives us a special attack boost. Scizor was also frightening since it used Sword Stance and has priority. Although I did have an answer. Well, almost. See, I thought it would attack and I'd be smart getting a Silk Trap off, but no. He just kept roosting and Sword Stancing. I, I swear they never gave it roost. Am I wrong? Okay, that was a tough fight. I I'll give it to you. But as always, when things get tough, I just lead Gwen the next fight for a nice sticky web. And Wiggler can finish Glamora off. Now this does suck as toxic debris is a thing, but I'm sure it won't bite me in the butt. Anyways, Wiggler can triple dive for chip on Scizor, and Zhang Zhang can finish that off even though he had an Aka Berry. Ha! Take that, Neutron. Zhang Zhang was also able to take down Dawn Fan thanks to the boost from Torch Song, and even get some chip on Alolan Muck. Hazards doesn't affect Blubbers, and a single Bulldoze KOs that. And finally, the devil was last. This stupid bat. By using Yawn, I was able to rock Tomb three times before going down, and then Jules just electrocuted it to death. Now that's that's how it's done. And it's all thanks to this weak ass spider. Weak in the base games, I mean. I love you so much here though. From here we needed to go deal with the pseudo Wudo, but I guess I forgot to grab the squirt bottle, so I headed back, planted some citrus berries, and now we can squirt all over this pseudo... wait, ah sh... Anyways, we gotta go stop Ariana in the ruins of Alf. And I already got the strat down for these fools. Mystical fire? Oh, how did you live that, Gwen? Gwen continues to impress me with every fight. Now, obviously, Gwen bites the dust, but Zhang Zhang is in, and I'm torn on whether to use Torch Song or just Shadow Ball. But I do Torch Song once and then Shadow Ball for the kill, and then Arbok comes out, who just casually Mega Evolves into a Poison Dark type. I did get some decent damage off before dying, though, so I gotta give Zhang Zhang props. And good thing, too, as Arbok has Ice Fang, which thankfully didn't get rid of Blubbers, so a Bulldoze wins the engagement. There. Now obviously Blubbers goes down right after, but Jules is alive and well, ready to dual wing beat Bioplume to death. Pluck all those leaves away. The game is getting hard though, I, I can feel it. I mean this thing poisoned us, so when we KO'd Bioplume, Jules also went down in the same turn. I had no idea who was her final Pokemon, so I just sent in Wiggler and this is way better than sending in Tauros. Uh, okay, maybe not. Tails, it looks like you're all that I have left. Hopefully that Intimidate does something. You know, to be honest, if I didn't get the crit drill pack, I think we live. I can't believe it came that close. Second time didn't go any better as Spit Ops outright died to Mystical Fire, and third time it was going pretty similar to Attempt 1, but I got frozen. But Blubbers was also hitting right through the freeze, so I don't know if that's a bug or what. I think freeze doesn't actually freeze you, it just creates a frostbite effect, like poison. But to be honest, throughout this whole thing, I just wasn't paying attention. But yeah, it went the exact same way for Attempt 3, and I mean it. Honchkrow got another crit, and that means this thing probably has super luck and a scope lens. Now, I know we could just make a new team, but we're so close with our main team. All we need to do is not get crit on that last turn. A couple attempts later, for some reason, the AI went for Calm Mind, so Gwen was able to just cut for the KO and got some added chip. 
Now, unfortunately, Blubber's bulldoze didn't finish it off, and he couldn't even outspeed, so Zhang Zhang had to do the honors. But this is good, as now Honchko is out, so I hard switch for an Intimidate. It still gets the crit with Drill Peck, but Jules is still alive for a big Electro Ball. And with that dual wing beat, it finally wins us the battle. Jeez, Ariana, go sing or something. After this, they move to Dark Cave, and we just find a Mega Ring chilling on the floor. And as you saw with Arbok, there are new Megas in this game. However, I don't think there are many, if at all, for our Gen 9 mod which really blows. Archer was our next boss, and despite him having heaters like Metagross as his lead, Mega Houndoom, and Annihilate, he was pretty simple. Annihilate was probably the most difficult one, but that was about it for that fight. Also, I completely forgot about Annihilate, so I gotta find myself a Mankey. With all that Team Rocket business out of the way, finally, it felt like an eternity, we head back to Professor Elm's lab, where he gives us that secret egg, and now we just continue on to Ecritique City. And on the way, I stopped to grab more big nuggets, because I got greedy, and I totally needed more money. Right before Ecritique, we do find a Sheath and a Milnior, which boost the power of slicing moves and hammer moves, respectively. Pretty neat items. And I love that they add this, because that's just one more thing making my spit ups the most powerful being on the planet. At this rate, I'd believe he created the Pokemon universe. The first thing we do in this city is go to the Burnt Tower to fight Silver, and I just hate Crobats, man. But would you believe me if I told you Gwen actually took this thing down? I did the usual, Silk Trap and Sticky Web, but then two cuts destroy the bat since Dual Wing Beat wasn't doing anything. Never thought I'd see the day Spit Ops would take down a Crobat, or any flying type for that matter. Anyways, from there, Zhang Zhang swept the rest of his team thanks to Torch Song and Sticky Webs. Well, almost the rest of his team. Alakazam is just a speed demon, and Skeledurge isn't. We did go say hi to the legendary dogs, even though one of them is clearly a cat, and now we can take on Morty. He says we don't have a chance, and I say we do. Especially when you lead something like Runarigus. Let me explain. This thing has Shore Up, Stealth Rocks, EQ, and Shadow. Shadow Claw. So I lead Skeledurge, who can Will-O-Wisp. Then obviously, to no one's surprise, Gwen comes in for a Sticky Web. And to top it all off, we have Spike back on the team. For an easy Intimidate and Home Claw setup. Which, by the way, I forgot to level him up to the cap on the first attempt, but hey, he almost swept at level 37. That's pretty impressive. But to be honest, it looks like I didn't need to restart, because regardless, at level 45, Typhlosion still outspeeds KOing Spike. And on top of that, his Grimnay ability pops upon our death, boosting his special attack. I also brought Lola with me as she has Sucker Punch and doesn't quite get the KO on it, granting another special boost for him. However, I have Wiggler with Aqua Jet, although I probably would have outsped either way. But Morty has six Pokemon, and his last one is his most precious one, Mega Gengar. Very luckily, we do still outspeed with Wiggler and do half with the Triple Dive, but of course Gengar has Energy Ball to retaliate. With this, we only have one Pokemon who outspeeds, and the other two would probably die. But Jules has Volt Switch, so all we have to do is Volt Switch, get out of there and sack Gwen. Then we just Volt Switch one more time for our Ghosty Gym Badge. That fight worked out perfectly with that team, and it's been our most simplest gym yet. The next route was a weather route, meaning there are constant sandstorms going on here, and you know what else that means? No fun. That's what that means. I even had to bring Nevetta to some of these fights. Yo, Toadscrew looks awesome in his Gen 2 sprite. Anyways, there were a lot of trainers on this route, mandatory as well. I mean, look at this level 1 Dawn fan. Can you guess what it's gonna do? Of course it has Sturdy, and of course it's gonna use Endeavor. Just so that sandstorm storm can finish us off. This rich girl is just bored. She has so much money that she's done everything in life and she's bored. So she bought this Dawn fan and is just catching any trainer that comes through this route. That's a low blow. And on top of all that bullshit, it has Ice Shard for your steel, rock, and ground types. <laughs> like, leave me alone, lady. Over on Route 39, I took on this rampaging Tauros, which just happened to get an Omni boost, was level 60, and had annoying flinching moves. It wasn't until my own Tauros came in for me to finish it off. Some good things did come out of these routes though, like us seeing Mega Sandaconda, and I totally wish this was real. It's so sick. But that wasn't it. We can not only get Tinkatuff here, but it looks like the other Tauros forms are indeed in the game, which means I can keep Tauros and get rid of Wiggler for someone else. The cool thing about Tinkerbell here is that we can attach the Milnior item on it for a boost in hammer moves. And with her signature move Gigaton Hammer and this new move Pixie Hammer, and the fact that she gets a ton of hammer moves later, she's gonna be hidden like a truck. And before moving on to Olivine City, I wanna get another Tauros, since I didn't name the first one, and I don't feel like finding the name Raider. And in the process, a shiny Sandy Ghast appeared. Why couldn't you be a Gen 9 Pokemon? And it would've been great as well because Water Compaction is now immune to water type moves. I don't know if the shiny odds are increased in this game, and if they're not, wow, I can't believe we ran into that. 
Upon arriving in Olivine, we immediately take on Chris, who funnily enough, used to fake out at the same time that we did. Regardless, this fight was pretty straightforward, going back and forth until, well, we won. And after this, we are tasked with taking the darn potion to Cyanwood, and this is where I realized I forgot to fight the Kimono Girls for Surf. But Chris gave us flies, so it's not too big of a deal. Oh, never mind. I guess the old man just gives us Surf. Thanks, dude. With that, we surfed on these next two rainy routes that weren't as annoying as the Sandstorm route, and in no time, we arrived in Cyanwood City, a luxurious resort. Nah, I'm just playing. This place is a barren wasteland. There's nothing to do here. I don't know who in their right mind would plan a trip to Cyanwood City, and whoever lives here is just crazy. Now, this city is still worth coming to aside from a gym, as this guy gives us the egg move section of minimal grinding, so now we can teach egg moves to our Paldean Pokemon. And this is great as it allows Gwen to learn a new move called Twin Blades. A slicing move that hits twice for a total of 100 damage and it never misses. I don't know how, but they made me love this Pokemon more than I already did. And it also gives Tinkerbell a bunch of hammer moves, like I mentioned before, which is just insane. Anyways, we go get that secret potion I was talking about, and just when we leave, we're robbed by a Team Rocket member. Oh no, how will I ever catch up to you walking two miles an hour? My character's a scaredy cat, man. Just pull a lance and hyper beam him. Cyanwood Gym is closed. Chuck is out for lunch? Well, I guess this gym is gonna be close forever then. Have you seen Chuck? You seen does pop up here, and while he was easy, Tails here lived at 1 HP from Omega Gengar's Dazzling Gleam, and I just wanted to tell you guys, it makes me so proud. By defeating him, he tells us the Rocket Grunt went to the Safari, which is absurd as we literally see him go directly up and not pass this guard whatsoever. Anyways, from here we can enter Chuck's gym, and we're greeted with this monstrosity of a gym puzzle. And already, I can tell this man was not out getting food. He's totally on something. Oh no, did I lock myself in? Am I stuck? Mm, no. Am I stuck? No. Oh, for the love of Arceus, I'm not stuck. I got the colored boulders in. I, I indeed was stuck. I really was not understanding that gym puzzle at all. Either way, it was time to face off against Mr. Munchies himself. He leads Grand Bowl. As I lead, you guessed it, Gwen. Doing the same thing I've always been doing, and I'm not ashamed of it. And once that's done, we're going to do the same thing as with Morty. Only this time, I brought Duncan with us. You guys remember her, right? Well, she gets the move Baton Pass and Work Up, so by using both of these moves, we can pass it to Tails, who can finish setting up with Work Up, and from there, well, we should sweep. Keyword, should. The Fairy Puppy and the Angry Monkey both go down easy, but Sneasler is a bit different. See, Sneasler has a base 120 speed stat, so Tauros can't actually outspeed with his base 100, and I even have happen to have a boosting speed nature. On top of that, Sneezer has Fake Out, but the good news is Tails here is rocking a Citrus Berry, which will put us at more health than when Sneezer came out. All that needs to happen now is hopefully we live a move. Very unfortunately, Tails does not live a move and can't get his sweep off. However, Blubbers does avenge him gracefully with a ginormous earthquake. Great job, Blubbers. With that out of the way, Quavo comes in as those sticky webs stick him up and slow him down. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I thought Triple Axel was a triple dive and I'd get health from Water Absorb but no, that was just a nice type move. Sorry, blubs. Luckily, I do still have Tinkerbell kicking, and she can just take that out with a pixie hammer. From here, Chuck's ace comes in, Lucario, and you better bet it's a mecha. Now, I totally misclicked here, but at least I did get chip with Duncan thanks to sticky webs. And can you believe a pixie hammer didn't KO this thing? Play Rough did so much, and that did nothing. If I just had hammer arm, I think we would have won. Chuck, you're really starting to piss me off. <sighs> okay, same thing happened again, but this time I brought Jules since he's super fast, but the only problem was hitting Hurricanes on a certain Pokemon. I do have a wide lens on Jules, but still. And the worst part is Lucario came in before Sneasler, which is the reason I brought Jules in the first place. And this wouldn't matter had Kukwavel not had a Focus Sash and an ice type move. You remember, triple axel. Anyways, Duncan can finish off Quaquavo with a play rough. Sneezler dies again to Blubbers. And to my surprise, thanks to Silk Trap, Gwen was able to kill Breloom with two X scissors, winning us the battle. Okay, that was an annoying gym leader to say the least. After that, we head through Route 47 and just happen to find a shiny charm on the floor. But clearly, I don't need it, considering I found a shiny without it. And we also came across the TM for Bulk Up, which is huge for Tails. And we can safely use this against Proton and Patrell as Gwen's Silk Traps. This allows Tails to just sweep Petrol's team. We did accidentally poison his Mega Heracross, who has Guts. However, Tails was faster thanks to Sticky Webs once again. And after that, Proton's side went down pretty easily. Right after this, I grabbed an item, expecting maybe one, two, 
three items, and I ended up getting like 40 items in that one Pokeball. If that's not a sign for things to come, I, I don't know what is. I'm scared. The lighthouse was long, but once we got to the top, we give Amphi her medicine, and now ships won't start crashing out in the sea. And we can finally take on Jasmine. It looks like the game is changing, with her having a trick room up for the entire fight. Oh, and did I mention this is a double battle? But remember when I said I got 40 items? Well, one of those happens to be the room service item, which makes us slower in trick room. Jasmine leads these two, and Agron is also holding room service, which sucks, but I put mine on Claude Sire since he's the slowest guy I have in all of my arsenal. Anyways, I led Jong Jong and Tails. Jong Jong because he could destroy Ferrothorn, and Tails because not only does he get an Intimidate off, but he can destroy Agron with close combat. Now, I did put a Charty Berry for Head Smash so that Skeledurge lives, and this allows us to KO Ferrothorn, and of course, Tails takes out Agron since it doesn't have Sturdy. From here, Magnezone and Steelix are in, and I'm minus on both defense stats on Tails. By the way, Steelix is part dragon type in this game. Pretty neat. From there, I switched Tails out into Gwen as she can't do much in this game, and I tried to will o -Wisp Mega Steelix, but it protected and Magnezode Volt switched into Copper Aja, which is not in the documentation, so this is a surprise. Obviously, both of these guys are done, but I swapped in Tails for an Intimidate as well as Pepper. Thankfully, nobody died next turn, and they both popped their Citrus Berries, but we just missed the KO on Mega Steelix, and I'm pretty sure it's over now. My best play is to switch into Sack Jewels, but what sucks is Steelix protected again on Pepper's Flamethrower. They both very tragically died next turn, and another Intimidate goes off with Tails. And Blubbers comes in, with that room service item I was talking about earlier. Honestly, I thought Blubbers was going to win us the fight here, but I forgot that Escavalier was still on her team, and it has Drill Run, which destroys Blubbers. Ah, damn, that gym is hard. It was clear that I needed to go back to the drawing board. And so I started looking, and I found out very quickly that Tails gets to move Curse which will lower our speed and raise our attack. Skeledurge does as well, but it is a ghost type, so it won't work the same. Himalaya also gets access to Curse, but I'm not sure how long he'll live. Now, I basically did the exact same thing to start off, only this time when these two are out, I swapped into Jewels, which happened to be an amazing turn, as we know Steelix is going to protect, so we Torch Song Magnezone, and Jewels has Volt Absorb for Magnezone's move. And the next turn, I have no idea what happened. Steelix Draco fangs Jewels, but then Magnezone goes for a Polarity Pulse, which does end up KOing Zhang Zhang, and Torch Song quite literally torches Steelix to death. This fight right now is huge, and it's about to get bigger as Caparaja targets Himalaya with an Iron Head, doesn't KO, and thanks to Trick Room, Himalaya can go first against Magnezone for a Hammer Arm. And since Zhang Zhang isn't dead, boom, we torch the F out of Caparaja, leaving only one Pokemon left, Escavalier. And to top it all off, for some reason, she targets Himalaya again, and that Akaberry cannot save her from a plus for Torch Song to the face. She must have a thing against Garganackles. I can't believe I only lost two Pokemon, and that was only the second attempt. With that obstacle over, we can head into Route 42, which if you can't tell, there's a permanent draw going on. I hope the water Pokemon are okay. Oh, and out of nowhere, random trainers just started having Megas as well, so that's fun. When we fought Chris again, she was difficult, so much so that it got down to just Tails versus her Mega Ampharos. We did come out on top, but it was pretty close. It was an annoying little route, but not too bad. So we arrived in Mahogany Town in one piece. On the next route up, we can find Toad Scroll and finally found a Gen 9 Mon on the first try. After defeating the not so rare shiny Gyarados, we head to the Rocket HQ, where upon entry, we don't even get to see Dragonite Hyper Beam that one team Rocket member. It just says Dragonite return. So this time, I think Lance definitely just committed murder. Anyways, from here, I go through the base like you normally would. And once it came time to fight Ariana, we had to fight Archer with her. And I can only enter three Pokemon to fight. So I entered Jewels, Toadette, and Tails. Now thank Arceus Lance has Hydreigon, because I totally looked over that Marowak had Lightning Rod, so I couldn't even KO Gyarados with Thunderbolt. And on top of that, Lance destroyed Marowak in one hit. The chip on Gyarados also helped since it had a Walkenberry for Thunderbolt. And Hydreigon wasn't his only beast. He had a Mega Charizard X, which obliterated that Togekiss. Now unfortunately they both targeted Toadette, so she couldn't even do anything, and it doesn't make it any better that there's two Megas on the field with crazy stats. My only Pokemon left was Tails against two Megas. Since Dragonite just died to an Ice Fang, I really thought it was over. But it looks like these guys couldn't really hit Paldean Tauros, at least hard. So we ate hits, KO'd Arbok, ate a Citrus Berry, outsped Houndoom the next turn for the KO, and it was just Mamoswine left. Of course, we do outspeed, and a close combat pummels this mammoth to the ground in one single blow. Tails, you are literally a legend. Lance might have been showing off in the beginning of the battle, but Tails stole the show at the end.
I cannot believe they made these stupid electrodes difficult too. I had to bring Nevetta, who can live a move and priority ice shard for the KO. With all that done, we can fight the seventh gym leader, Price. And the interesting thing about this fight is every battle is an inverse battle, meaning this Obama Snow's Razor Leaf is quad effective against Pax Caliber. <sighs> This game just continues to not be fun. Now, I figure the only way to keep my sanity is to try and sweep with something. Price leads Ninetales, and it's his only Pokemon who is insanely fast. So I led Mabelstiff to Scary Face. From there, I go into Daxpun, who can set up some workups, and thankfully we did get three off, but I don't know if it'll be enough, as Ninetales does set up an Aurora Veil. Also, there's Permanent Snow, which boosts every Ice type's defense, including the Pokemon I'm trying to sweep with, but it can also make us miss. Anyways, once we're as set up as possible, I switch into Nevetta with Baton Pass and Icicle Spear Ninetales to the Shadow Realm. Realm. Why Icicle Spear? Well, because it has Focus Ash, and it'll do the max amount of damage, that being 125, thanks to our loaded dice item. Now from here, his Mega comes out, and it is faster thanks to Slush Rush, which I didn't think it would be, but a Wood Hammer misses the KO, and we get a nice Glaive Rush off, which does kill. And I don't know if Aqua Tail would do more damage since it's now super effective thanks to the inverse thing going on in this battle. Anyways, I Ice Shard that, and Mammal Swine just finishes this whole thing since he has Ice Shard. Luckily for round two, I came up with something a tad bit better. Better. We lead Mabelstiff doing the same thing, however this time I go into my prized possession, Spit Ops, to get a nice sticky web off. And with that we Twin Blade to pop Sash. From there we let Gwen break her neck and Duncan can come in to start setting up. By the way, Duncan the first time was level 65, my bad. But now she's at the cap so we work up three times and Obama Snow comes in. Can you believe that Obama Snow still outspeeds with a minus one in speed? I know Slush Rush is in effect, but what the f- Oh wait, Pokemon might have different stats in this game, so Mega Obama Snow's speed isn't 30, it's buffed all the way to 70. Pair that with Slush Rush and Snow, yeah, we're never outspeeding. Either way, Toadette comes in, tries the Sludge Bomb for Chip, and I really wish I could Spore, but thanks to this crappy ability, it always goes last. Toadette, that was a gruesome death. This time around, I did bring Tinkerbell, but it made zero difference. Snow and this thing's defense means it tanks any move we throw at it. Super effective or not? It was clear I needed a new Baton Passer. I immediately thought of Tandem Mouse, but I couldn't remember if that thing even got Baton Pass. Lo and behold, it does through egg moves. And this is perfect because the setup move it has is tidy up, which not only raises our attack, but raises our speed, meaning Obama Snow can get outsped. So for the billionth time, I do this again breaking Sash, and now instead of Duncan, we got Dom because he's all about family. And that's what's gonna carry us past this gym. Now the cool thing is we take the same amount of damage as Daxbun, but even better, when we pop Citrus Berry, we eat it twice thanks to our ability Cheek Pouch, which allows us to set up just a little bit more. And with that, Nevetta was out at plus four attack and speed. All right, Nevetta, let's do this. Okay, girl, don't miss now. Oh, well, that didn't kill. Oh, Aurora Veil's still up. Well, I guess using Ice Shard kind of worked out as we wasted all of our turns of that. Anyways, now let's do this, Nevetta. Everything on Price's team dies to a single Ice Icicle Spear. Aside from Mamoswine, who I did Ice Shard first since it has Ice Shard itself, but he never went for it and it died to an Icicle Spear. And even that big defensive juicy ass Hisuian Avalug can't live even three of those spears. And by the end of it, Price has so much respect for us and he admires us. I'd hope so, man. That was beyond annoying. Honestly, might have to keep Mousehold on the team. Nah, screw that. What in the world is Rillaboom's Mega? Our next boss fight was Petrol, and this was difficult. Surprise, surprise. I didn't really have a strat, but I was just going in guns blazing. I did do the usual Gwen strat, and Mansana tried to Sarah Bomb Croak to lower speed. Also, I really have no clue how to evolve Diplin. I don't even know if the Dragon Sheer TM is in this game, so if any of you know, let me know. Anyways, Crook went down next turn after he knocked off our Sheath item, which I don't know if it mattered for knocking out Weezing with Twin Blade. I doubt it. Either way, our leads are still kicking. Now, unfortunately, Gold Dango went for a Make It Rain, which damages both. And on top of that, it wasn't affected by Sticky Web thanks to its Air Balloon. So I did try to Serum Bomb, which obviously didn't work because yeah, Make It Rain. The good news is Tinkerbell isn't affected by Toxic Spikes, and Goldango is at minus two, so next turn it uses Nasty Plot as Wee Swords Dance, and Gwen KOs Weezing. Now, I didn't take into account Iron Moth coming out next, and on top of that, it has the Levitate ability. So again, no Sticky Webs activate. And these two ended up going down. Tauros does get in getting poisoned, and Jules avoids it because, well, he's a flying type. And Jules then KOs Goldango with Thunderbolt. And now Iron Moth does use Giga Drain, but Tails is a G and lives on literally 1 HP. And since we have a Citrus Berry, the poison doesn't KO. And Raging Bull obliterates the Fire Moth. 
With Sticky Web finally taking effect against these two, a Hurricane blows Heracross away in two close combats, decimates Slacking. I can't believe I won that in like two attempts. It's been a while since we've fought Silver, and honestly the rival fights in this game are the least of our worries as it's a simple setup with Proton passers. Tinkerbell can destroy his entire team with ease. And the same can be said for Proton, as it is somewhat easy to set up on Gomora. It hits like a truck and does get a toxic debris off, but I did have to hit it to break its sash. Dom's tidy up move though does get rid of the toxic spikes while setting us up, so we just Baton pass into Tauros. Finish setting up with bulk up, and not a single thing lives. And I love how he just doesn't even say anything. He just accepted that he got his ass whooped. Up next is a double battle with Archer and Ariana, and Silver is our partner for this. And I can only bring three Pokemon. So I brought Jules, Tails, and Tinkerbell. Jules is our lead since they lead literal legendaries, and they both happen to be flying types, which is great as I do have Discharge plus a choice specs. So turn one, we do tons, while turn two, Lugia protects and Ho-Oh goes down. After that, I Discharge knocking out Lugia, as well as Silver's Luxray, which is good as Celesteela is out next on our side. With Tinkerbell on the field, now we hammer arm Mega Houndoom, and thankfully Heat Wave didn't KO us. Celesteela also managed to flinch Brute on net with Air Slash. There's no hope of Tinkerbell living, and no hope for the rest of the team. I, I mean, seriously, what am I supposed to do without Legends or Megas? I tried again with the same Pokemon, only this time Jules doesn't have a choice specs, and it took three turns to KO, but it still went the same way. Only this time, Arlock and Iron Thorns came in, probably because Celesteela is out. Thankfully, it has a walk and berry too. That is, if Iron Thorns wasn't out. Anyways, I was going to Volt Switch, but nope, Arbok straight up outsped because it lowered our speed on entry thanks to its ability. But Silver surprised me as its Polarity Pulse absolutely demolished Iron Thorns in one hit. What the heck, Silver? Tails does get an Intimidate off on Arbok, but it didn't matter. First, Celesteela was paralyzed, so it died. Second, Raging Bolt didn't KO. And third, Arbok got a crit corrosive jaw. We definitely would have lived. So now these two are out. And thankfully Alakazam KOs Houndoom, however, it just dies right after. And while there's only one side of this fight left, I don't think Tinkerbell can do it. I mean, that Pixie Hammer did nothing. Luckily, Gigaton Hammer does KO after, but again, there's no hope. For them, that is! This thing cannot touch us! Tinkerbell just hammered away with Pixie Hammer and Gigaton Hammer. Adios, Bonnet. I can't believe you did that, girl. All right, Giovanni, let's do this. What? You're, you're going to your gym? You're nothing but a wussy. Oh, thank God. That man had legendaries on his team, too. I was shaking in my boots. Let's go fight Claire. And this was not a long trek at all, since Ice Cave is literally just one ice puzzle and we're in Blackthorn. And once we're here, I go to the route below to catch myself a prime ape who I named Mojo Jojo. Our last gym fight is actually not Claire. I guess she got fired and they just chucked Cynthia in here as her replacement, which is pretty disgraceful as this fight is so sweepable. All I did was snarl and this made her AI use flamethrower so I can set up more with Dom as the attempts before this, she would just get a boost from Hyper Voice and I couldn't do much setting up. But yeah, then we just baton pass that into Tinkerbell, get a sword stance off and everything dies to hammer moves. Very very anticlimactic, but it's probably because the league is gonna be hell. Now we did have to defeat this Dragonite boss, but with Nevetta it wasn't too bad and then we can claim our gym badge. All we had to do now was go back home and head to Route 27, which is another drought route as well as a sandstorm route and probably more. And these trainers play to their weather effects very well. They did not come to play around. Now I don't know if this is a bug, but I did lose a battle and went back to the Pokemon Center and I could fly all the way here skipping all the trainers. Sweet! Ah, uh, you're a little... I just want to touch up on one of these trainers in rain. Most of his team are swift swimmers to outspeed anything you throw out and they get boosted by rain. I literally had to bring out the sticky web strat plus dom tidy up plus duncan work up but ton pass just to beat him. That was probably the most annoyingest fight up until this point. Whoever made this, your heart's filled with evil. How did I know Chien Pao would appear? Once we're done with that treacherous route, we bump into Gary and it looks like Giovanni is not post-game stuff. Gary takes us to Cerulean, where we're going to fight Giovanni with him. And this was no joke, for real. This man has legendaries, paradox Pokemon, and shinies. Honestly, it would be easier if I didn't have to fight it with blue. All three of his Pokemon just eat dirt within the first 30 seconds. Now, despite Giovanni's roster being insane, on my like third attempt, I led different Pokemon and somehow got a scenario where Goldango 
is minus three special attack thanks to using Make It Rain and Cartana stayed alive, which is huge because it does so much damage to half of his team and destroys his most important Pokemon, Mega Mewtwo X. My jaw dropped when I saw that HP bar go down. By the end of it, Gary and I both had Pokemon on the field and Giovanni's plans were foiled. That is, if we didn't have to fight Mewtwo right after and, well, die. Meaning I have to fight Giovanni all over again. What is this game? And it took me like 20 tries just to beat him again. That's not an exaggeration. Over and over I died until eventually I swept with Tinkerbell. And can you believe Mewtwo almost made me fight Giovanni 20 more times? Because I almost lost. In in the end, Nevada's Ice School Spear put it in the red enough to where an Ice Shard finished it off from where it was at. Holy crap, I take it back about the trainer in the rain. Giovanni is the most annoyingest trainer in the whole game. Chris, I I'm not really in the mood. Oh, come on. This was a tough fight. Shocker. But it was just a lot of switching around and stuff, and it actually came right down to the wire against her Iron Bundle versus Mojo Jojo. And thank god that was first try. From here I took on Victory Road, and I'm so looking forward to being done with this game. And to my surprise, since I didn't look at the encounter table, Iron Moth is my very first encounter here. And I literally yelled, thank Arceus. Finally, I get a legendary. Okay, it's not a legendary, but it might as well be. And that wasn't the only Paradox Pokemon in this cave. Every single one was at my disposal. How funny would it be if it was just a full team of these guys? I mean, they are Generation 9. Honestly, at this point, screw it. My arsenal just got a whole lot more powerful. And just when I was about to be done catching the ones I wanted, I accidentally didn't name Iron Bundle, and I went searching for another one. Well, I guess that shiny charm did kick in, giving me a shiny Iron Valiant. And you guys don't understand, I'm pretty sure this is the 1% encounter alongside Roaring Moon. Maybe not 1%, but it's definitely one of the rarer ones. Oh my god. Now we're gonna destroy this Elite Four. Honestly, this Iron Bundle is special now. I'm not gonna nickname it. The only challenge left before the Elite Four was Silver, and with my full team of monsters, he was over in a second. I also couldn't find the metal alloy to evolve Duraludon, so that's kind of a bummer. Also, here's the team. We have Ultron the Iron Moth, who has the Levitate ability. Since apparently you can just purchase ability patches, I know I said in the beginning I wouldn't change abilities, but that was with the minimal grinding option. I didn't think you could just buy them outright. Anyways, we have Medusa, who has Dazzling as its ability, but I think I'm going to change it back as I do have a booster energy. Our Shiny Link, who has adaptability, which is just broken. Iron Bundle with Snow Warning to boost its defense and set up an Aurora Veil. Dova, our Roaring Moon with Tough Claws to hit harder. And Sandy Shocks with Gaia Force, which boosts our Earth Power. Now, the Elite Four aren't just straightforward. Each member has two teams that they can choose from, and I'm pretty sure it's random. Or at least that's what I thought, but maybe it changed from the documentation? If it didn't change and it's still like this, Will is our first match, and he goes with his second team that leads these two. Oh, and did I mention it's a double battle? You guys know how I feel about doubles. And I have the right to feel that way. I got sent back to the lobby in mere seconds with Paradox Pokemon. Second time around, I led these two, and Psychic Terrain is up for the entirety of this fight. Since Aditi just uses Follow Me, I D-dance with Dova, and Medusa also tanks Monkey Dory's hits, since we're a special defensive beast. The unfortunate thing about Aditi using Follow Me is I tried to use Throat Chop on Monkey Dory, and this results in Medusa going down. From there, Tapu Lele was in. Tapu Lele, you, you gotta be kidding me. It wasn't too bad though, as Throat Chop demolished that, however, Iron Valiant got disintegrated by Monkey Dory, and the damage dealt to Roaring Mood was actually a crit. What a tank. From there, Ultron came in and Combalion on his side. Nothing is beating Dova at plus one, so a single throw chop destroys Iron Crown in one shot. Jesus. Ultron also managed to live in Expanding Force, and Dova is immune to that. Pretty much everything else from there died to throw chop, and this is why I kept Monkey Dory alive. Roaring Moon is a G. I find it cool how they ask if they should revive your Pokemon in case you're doing a Nuzlocke, but this is suicide if you do a Nuzlocke. I'm not that good. I get it. But seriously, how does one survive a Nuzlocke of this game? Anyways, Koga was next, and I led Iron Bundle as he led Glamora. I went for an Aurora Veil, so hopefully Link could sweep. But once Glamora was dead, Petrarch came out. No joke, this is the first time I'm seeing this Gen 9 Pokemon, but either way, that totally ended my sweep right there. So I tried Dova next, and we did get poisoned, so we're on a timer. I was only able to knock out that and Mega Beedrill, but Mach had Drain Punch, and, well, Dragon Claw didn't KO. Sandy Shocks took care of that, and Iron Moth started destroying everything on my team until it was just my own Iron Moth, Ultron. And it was close as he was getting boost from Fiery Dance, and we weren't. Ultron did come out on top, and Needle King was in. Like I said, I do have the Levitate ability, so I'm not worried about any 
ground type moves, so I just morning sun, which was amazing. Looks like Koga can't touch us and we end up winning. That was too close. Oddly enough, the documentation for this game shows Koga having a Hoopa on Pound. So like I said, I'm guessing they don't have two different teams anymore and their teams are just set in stone now. So Bruno starts off with a Steelix and I led wrong with Medusa. However, by switching into Ultron for free, we take that snake down with a fiery dance and Incineroar actually uses Fake Out on his third turn in for whatever reason. And this lets Ultron win the engagement. Makes no sense, but right after Zero Aura is in. Iron Bundle with Aurora Veil and two Frost Breaths were enough and Zamazenta? What are these people on and where are they getting all these legendaries? Sandy Shocks, which I just realized I didn't nickname, did get an Earth Power off. However, the only reason we did was because of Aurora Veil being up so he couldn't finish it off. And we just snowballed from there. The good news is we don't actually have to fight them all over. We can just go straight back to Bruno's room and try again, this time with our Gwen strat from earlier. Kind of a cop out, but I don't care. I'm over this game. This ensures that Link can sweep and finally KO that Behemoth easy as well as Mega Machamp. Damn. Karen is the final E4 brain, and this was the easiest fight of all. Again, Gwen is here, now ready to finish what she started, and this leads to us eventually swords dancing with our shiny Iron Valiant. And that was it. Everything started dying to Drain Punch, and she was freaking out. All she was doing, and I'm not making this up, was switching from Chiyu every time I killed one of her Pokemon. I'd KO something, she'd go into Chiyu, and switch into something to die to a Drain Punch. I have no idea what the AI was doing. Maybe it just knew that she was royally fucked. It would be you doing that, Karen. With all that out of the way, there was just one more thing standing in the way of our Gen 9 Pokemon becoming the champions of the hardest Johto game, Lance. The Dragon type, perhaps Flying type, Master. And he leads his prized possession, Dragonite. Of course, I lead mine, which is Gwen, to get some webs on the field. From there, I went into Iron Bundle to Auroraville as usual, but I did let him get some action by Frost Breathing Dragonite, and this as well, until ultimately dying to a Raging Bolt with a move that I do every night in bed. Medusa was able to destroy this thing pretty easily, and then Charizard was in. Of course, it is going to be Charizard X because no one gives Y any love and that will KO Medusa. And from there, I just couldn't keep up, but to be honest, I was just toying around with him by not setting up. Let's beat him for real this time. Okay, maybe not. See, I couldn't just sweep with any of my guys since Latios just outspeeds since it doesn't get affected by webs due to having levitate. But eventually, I brought back who I started this journey with, my best friend alongside Gwen, Zhang Zhang. And this way, we can do everything the same except we burn Dragonite so that Dova can come in and Dragon dance. But this also kind of didn't work as I didn't get to set up as much as I wanted to and our Caladon lived a Dragon Claw. The good news is Medusa against Raging Bolt was the answer, as her special defense lets her tank moves and Calm Mind and Wish all the way up to plus 6, which is totally not needed. But yeah, from there everything died to a Moonblast and Latios's Luster Purge did laughable damage. And with Lance finally defeated, we have completed our goal of making Gen 9 Pokemon champions of Johto. I don't know if every Gen 9 Pokemon is in this, but it does seem that way and it's a surprised me that they have them all in here as it gave me way more encounters than I thought I would have had. And to be honest, without Paradox forms, that probably would have been way more annoying than it actually was. It was still annoying, but it definitely would have been hell. And I love how we end off with Gwen and Zhang Zhang in the Hall of Fame. How poetic. This is a great difficulty fan game and it made me want to rip my hair out like 90% of the time, but I also loved every second of it despite me hating on it at the same time. I give it a 9 out of 10, but only because I was suffering. And I'm glad they're self-aware that I suffered through all this.